How long, oh Lord, 
For the world began, I am In the silence of the dawn, I am Spoken to existence Every star and every man I am I am In the dark and empty land I am In our hunger and our thirst I am As we wander in do not understand I am I am Oh Jesus Our Savior and our King Holy, holy, holy we sing Oh Jesus Perfecter of our faith creation bows at your name our king in robe and flesh I am in your presence now we stand I am oh the holy is the holy came to dwell in humbleness I am oh, I Good morning, Fellowship family. Would you stand with us? We're gonna celebrate and sing about the freedom and the life that we have in Christ Jesus.
morning. You have a seat. Good morning, fellowship. Morning. Welcome. And especially if you are new this morning, we want to say we're so happy that you're here to worship with us this morning and study his scriptures. Please click on the QR code behind me on the screen for more information, how to get plugged in here at Fellowship in a small group. And also please come visit us in the information booth. We would love to meet you personally. But I have a question for you. Can I say go hogs? Is that okay? You say that in church? So also, more importantly, April 9th is Easter. So 7 o'clock sunrise service in the West Field, and then family services at 9, 10, and 11 in the West Field, and then adult services in here in the worship center. So please come and celebrate the risen Christ with us on Easter, April 9th. We can't wait. Fellowship men, we have a great spring planned for you. April 14th, we're doing a four-man golf scramble at Stonebridge Meadows Golf Club in Fayetteville to sponsor Samaritan Church Springdale, so please join us for that. Also, May 5th and 6th is our men's overnight retreat at Ponca Bible Camp on the Buffalo River, and we have our own Dave Strong, who's going to be our personal chef that weekend. Excited about that. He's serving as prime rib on Friday night, so women of fellowship, if your man doesn't like golf, canoeing, fishing, or eating prime rib, there's nothing else I could do to help him. So it's the best I got. So sign up, sign up your man. Uh, we'd love to have you men at, that, at those two things with us to learn more about God, grow closer to God, and one another as well. Also, a special good morning to you who are not going on a spring break trip. We call that our staycation club. So... My wife and I are in that club because we got a little more excited than we should have on our Thanksgiving trip. And then after Thanksgiving, there's another cost called Christmas. So we got a little more excited about that. So we are here for spring break on a staycation. So speaking of spring break, 400 of our students are going to six different cities and Costa Rica on mission trips to tell others about Christ. So I know, isn't that awesome? So great. So our request to you is, let's join us, join them in prayer for that their lives will be even changed even more for Christ and the people that they will be impacting will be changed and also for safety to and from those trips. So would you join us as we pray for our students this morning? Lord, we thank you for each one of these students. We know it is an, a special appointment from you that they are on these trips. God, and what a wonderful time that they will have, God. Just bring them tons of joy and safety, and uh, we pray for salvations on the trip. We just pray as they get in your word and, and study, Lord, that they will be drawn closer to your heart, Lord, and that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. What 
giving and uh, we're gonna sing a new song it's called the finished work of Christ and that phrase is a big phrase and for me um, I've shared with the team all morning about how just understanding that phrase better has just changed everything about my life in Christ it's brought freedom and it's brought rest and so as we sing this song together today uh, I pray that the Lord uh, by the power of his spirit just continues to coach us up and tutor us in what, what it all means. It's called the finished work of Christ. I trade all for the new. I trade lies for the truth. I throw off these old Hold fast unto you. I cling to the cross where my Savior bled, where grace found a way to bring death to an end. Beautiful rest. When love paid my debt, so I'll sing your praise all of my days. Your blood flowing down like oceans of grace. My sins slipped away. I'm brought back to life. Here in the finished work of Christ. You came out of the grave. You came burst into life. Shattered the dark with your glorious light. In this battle for us, you ran to the fight. With mercy and grace, your arms open wide. The dawn of redemption, oh, put an end to the night. So I'll see you pray. this talent.
I'll sing your praise all of my days. Your blood flowing down like oceans of grace. My sin swept away, brought back to life. The hearing the finished work of Christ. I'll sing your praise with all of my heart. You buried my past and my future could start. I kneel at the cross. Let's pray together. Father God, I ask that you continue to teach me and you teach us what it all means, the finished work of Christ. How do we rest in that? Where do we look? We look to Jesus. Teach us how to rest in all that you have accomplished in and through our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus, and help us understand what that means and teach us to walk in a manner worthy of it all. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Well, open your Bibles this morning to the book of Daniel. Today we'll be anchored in Daniel chapter 9. We're actually in the final two weeks of our winter study of this Old Testament book of prophecy. So far, we've spent six weeks studying Daniel, and I, I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you have found a, a deeper connection to Christ through this book. I hope that there's been a heart work done in you, and I hope that you've learned more about the Lord as we've studied these deep truths of the faith. Daniel is a collection of stories and visions, uh, and, and there's six chapters dedicated to the stories. We call that the court tales, and then there's six chapters dedicated to prophecy. I try to think of Daniel in three ways. First, it's a book of history. Daniel is telling us courageous stories of how Daniel and his friends interacted with, they even stood up to kings and kingdoms of the past. Secondly, Daniel's a book of prophecy. It is foretelling future events. Some of those future events came to be in Daniel's day. Some were near Daniel's day and some have yet to come. We'll talk more about that next week. And then thirdly, the book of Daniel is a book of theology. It tells us about the nature and the character of God. Don't forget this. Daniel is the primary human character in the narrative, but God is the hero of the book. Amen? He's the focus of the book. And think about all that the Lord has taught us about himself in this text. In, in chapter one, we see that God rewarded he rewarded Daniel's resolve to be obedient to God's law as opposed to following the cultural uh, things of Babylon. In chapter 2, God revealed, and also in chapter 7 to 12, he un unveiled visions of the future to and through Daniel. He, some of those visions um, are still yet to be fulfilled, and some of those um, came true in Daniel's day. Uh, God also rescued in chapters 3 and 6. He rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, and then Daniel from the lion's den, and then God ruled. Chapters 4 and 5, he humbled the proud and lifted up the humbled. When he humbled the mighty kings of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he turned into a wild beast, and King Belshazzar, he took out through the writing on the wall. God is the hero of the story. He's the primary player enacting his sovereign will through his rule. So let's jump in and take a look at our passage today. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. And we are going to take a look at the first part of the chapter today. We'll finish it next week. And we're going to see one of the most powerful prayers of confession in all the scripture. And we're going to look at Daniel's going to the Lord to confess the sin of his people, but just a, a, a little foreshadow, we're gonna conclude our service today by us going to the Lord in confession. So prepare your heart. And not only would Daniel go to the Lord to confess the sin of his people, but he'd also go to the Lord and have a big 
request. We'll see that at the end of our text today. So read with me verse 1. It says, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel was reading the scriptures. He was having his time of devotion. And through reading the word of God, he had a major revelation. He became convinced that change was coming for his people. Remember that at this point, the Israelites are exiled. They're not in the promised land. They're not in Jerusalem. They're exiled to Babylon. And and he had a realization that soon that exile would end. And so he went before the Lord in prayer and repentance. I want to stop right off the bat and make a simple observation from the text. At this point in his life, Daniel is in his 80s, having survived the conquering of his own nation, the nation of Judah, having survived the desolation of his city, the city of Jerusalem, having lived as a foreigner in a foreign land for almost seven decades, he remained faithful to God. He consistently pursued and obeyed the Lord Despite his suffering, he remained faithful. And look at the evidence in the passage. He was still pursuing, even in his 80s, some basic spiritual habits. Prayer, scripture reading, fasting. And when it refers to being in sackcloth and and ashes, Daniel was taking a posture of humble repentance. He was You wear sackcloth, you adorn yourself with ashes as a symbol outwardly of an inward mourning. Well, what was he mourning? Well, he was mourning the sin of his people. So Daniel was actually practicing the discipline of confession. And so the life lesson right up front in our passage is this, that when it comes to living faithfully over the long haul, when it comes to growing spiritually and pursuing holiness with longevity, The spiritual disciplines are essential. Bible reading, prayer, fasting, confession, among others, are non-negotiable, essential habits for a follower of Christ. A few things that you'll hear us say around here at Fellowship often. You never graduate from the spiritual disciplines. You never grow up in the faith or in your sanctification or in your spiritual maturity to such an extent that you no longer need to pray and read the word of God. You hear me? I remember when I was in my 40s, I went to Robert Cup, who's kind of like my Yoda. He's like my, my Gandalf, my Dumbledore, if you will. And I was like, Robert, I want to finish well. And that's what I admire about you so much is that you're finishing well What's the key? And I thought he would like give me some algorithm or some formula or something. He just said, you never graduate from prayer and reading of the scripture every day. I was so disappointed. (laughs) I really thought it was going to be like, Sam, when you hit 46, it's at the 46th year, you just get it. You're just there. And, And still to this day, I was with Robert the other day and I said, how are you doing? He said, my time with the Lord is better than it's ever been. Isn't that encouraging? And I see that in Daniel's life. One of the other things we say around here a lot is that being comes before doing. That your external life, your your walk with the Lord should flow from your internal life. So your, your soul care is informing your hands and feet, your mouth for Christ. And then abiding in Christ is our primary work. That our job when we wake up tomorrow morning is not to go do things for the Lord before we just go and be still with him. We are branches. He is the the vine. We are pipes, not pumps. And so the the book of Daniel presents his, Daniel and his friends as models of faithfulness to God. 
Even in the midst of the harsh reality as living as exiles, as foreigners in a foreign land surrounded by a godless culture, Daniel and his men time and time again displayed unwavering and consistent faith. Think about what these guys went through. They were human trafficked. They faced death threats. They were abused by powerful, power-hungry politicians. They were tempted time and time again to be unfaithful to their God. They were threatened with the fiery furnace and the lion's den, yet they maintained allegiance to the God of Israel, to Yahweh. What kept them going? What was the key to their perseverance? Well, one factor that is revealed time and time again in this story is that they were consistent in prayer and fasting and worship, and scripture reading, as they relied on God's power, they pursued the basics of the faith. Back to the first three verses of the passage. Daniel is prompted to pray. And what prompted him to pray was really two events. Verse one talks about a regime change. So it tells us that there was a new king in charge, Darius, and he's actually the the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. So the Babylonians have faded away. Now the Persians are in charge. And Daniel thinks that maybe the Persians will show them the favor to return back to Israel that the Babylonians did not. So that's factor one. He's going to go to the Lord and say, all right, Lord, would you move in the heart of the Persian king? And by the way, that's exactly what would happen, that that God moves in King Cyrus's heart and he sends him back to Jerusalem. But verse two mentions the second thing that prompted Daniel to pray, and that was the word of God. Daniel had been reading the words of prophet Jeremiah and he noticed something, that the exile had an expiration date, that there was a promised end point. According to Jeremiah, the exile would last for 70 years. You see it several times in Jeremiah, but let me show you in Jeremiah 29. In verses 10 and 11, it says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, to Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a a hope and a future. Jeremiah prophesied that the Babylonian captivity would end after 70 years. And Daniel's doing the math. He was taken into Babylon as a teenager, see chapter 1. And he had been there almost 70 years. And he sees God's plan unfolding before him with this regime change and this countdown. So what an encouragement these two verses must have been to him. Think about what Daniel must have experienced in his heart when he read, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Daniel, you and your people will not remain as exiles forever. Now, that verse is probably familiar to you. Have you heard that one before? You have that one on your refrigerator? Maybe a coffee mug? Does anybody have that one? Did you paint that one and and bring it home on on a canvas? We use it often to encourage one another. But did you know that its context was the return from the exile? Don't forget the gravity of this verse. It's saying that the Lord had plans for his chosen people, Israel. There was hope for them to be rescued after 70 years living outside of the promised land. After seven decades under harsh Babylonian rule, living in a godless culture, being surrounded by idols, threatened with death from the furnace or the lion, he promised that he would return them to the land. This isn't just a verse to write on a post-it note and stick in a sack lunch before cheer tryouts. This isn't a verse that you just text before the ACT or write flippantly on a graduation card. Oh, that'll be a good one. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that. Are we clear? Let's just save all the emails. All right, I think I made eye contact with all of you online as well. Jeremiah 29, 11 could be a great verse for that. But don't use a post-it note. Go for it. Get out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and tell them what it's really all about. Dear Susie, 
as you try to hit your back handspring today for your cheer tryout, I want you to remember that the God of Israel, the God who had a hope and a plan for his people to bring them out of exile for, from 70 years in captivity, the God who shut the mouths of lions and protected the men from the fires of the furnace, the God who humbled the kings of Babylon, that God who had a plan for Israel has a plan for you. So do good. <laughs> I think that would be appropriate. And they probably hit their back handspring. Look at verse 14. Daniel's reading the, the prophecy of Jeremiah. It goes on. Promises to return them to the Lord and to the land. God says, I will be found by you. And that's actually what's happening in our passage today. The Israelites are turning their hearts back to God. I will be found by you. It's talking about repentance and restoration. And I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back to the place from which I carried you in exile, back to Jerusalem. The God promised to bring the nation of Israel back after 70 years. Can you imagine Daniel reading this in his devotional time and he sees the hope for Israel? Daniel discerned the will of God by reading the word of God. Verse two tells us that Daniel's understanding came from his study of the scriptures. Do you ever want God to speak to you? to guide you, to reveal his will to you or enlighten you with a, a truth in your life? Then read his word. I think that God speaks in a number of different ways. I think he speaks through his people. I think he speaks through the whispers of his spirit. I think he speaks through circumstances. But I think a primary way that the Lord speaks is through the scriptures, which we believe to be alive and active, illuminating and convicting. We believe that they are a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. We believe that this book is inerrant, it's infallible, and it's authoritative, and that it's God-breathed and it can equip you for everyday life. So I wanna invite you this morning to be like Daniel to follow his example and become a man or a woman of the book, a person who feeds on God's word daily. I want to implore you to become a student of the scriptures. So can I get really uber practical with you this morning? We are Fellowship Bible Church. We don't hide it. Bible's in our name. And we passionately believe that one of the keys to intimacy with Christ is through interacting with his word. So we wanna preach God's word, but we also wanna facilitate the study of it. So we wanna help you learn how to read your Bible on your own. So let me get really practical. If you're here today and you don't have a Bible, out in the foyer there's a table and I've put a whole bunch of Bibles out there and you can just take one for free. And, and stuck in there is a 31-day Bible reading plan. Now, if you have your own Bible, but you need a reading plan, we've got some reading plans out there. Spend a month reading God's word. That is also available online. I'll go a step further. If you have a neighbor, a coworker who could use a Bible, take them a Bible and tell them God bless you. Maybe this will help you in life. Secondly, we don't wanna just read the Bible personally. We wanna study it in the context of community. So Fellowship Bible Church is a group of small groups. We're not just a church with small groups. We're a church of small group, and it's our hope that everyone in here would find a community of faith to sit down and study God's word and eat a casserole that's mainly based on Velveeta cheese <laughs> and then wash it all down with a soda out of a solo cup. That's our goal for your life. So whether that's a community group or a men's group or a women's group, We've got small groups studying the Bible for children and for students. We want you to be people of the book. And then we have our training center. And the training center is kind of like our Navy SEALs outfit. They're there to take you deep in the faith. Robert Cup's Panorama of the Bible class or um, the uh, We Believe class, which studies theology. And we've got all kinds of offerings, live instruction here on our campus teaching. They're also available online if you want to just self-guide yourself through a class. 
Hey, let me tell you about something the training center is offering on April 14th and 15th. That's a Friday all day and a Saturday all day. Dallas Theological Seminary is coming here. And it's actually going to be President Dr. Mark Yarbrough is going to be here. So one of my good friends, one of the brightest minds doing theology in our world today. And he's going to give you an overview of the scriptures. So if you've ever in the back of your mind thought, man, I wonder what it's like to go to seminary. Come let Mark beat you over the head for two days in April and drink through a fire hydrant. Um, So he's going to give you an overview of the scriptures from a seminary prof's point of view. It's worth taking the day off. And so in 150 seats, if you want to interact with Dr. Yarbrough, you can find information online. So Daniel is prompted to go before the Lord by being a man of the book. He's reading the scriptures. Let's take a look at his prayer. Verse 4. He says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our ancestors and to all the people of the land. One of the things I see in Daniel's prayer model here is that he uses a pro-con method. He'll ping back and forth through professions of truth about the character of God and then to confessions of sin committed by the people. Pro, con, professions and confessions. Verse four contains the first profession of truth about God. He is the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. Daniel begins by acknowledging the greatness and loving kindness of the Lord. And I think it's good to begin our prayer time with declarations of praise. Jesus modeled that for us in the Lord's Prayer. How does the Lord's Prayer begin? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It begins with a declaration of the greatness of God. So verse 4 has the profession. Verses 5 and 6 contain the confession. We have sinned and done wrong. Daniel is confessing, that's plural, the sin of the nation, the wickedness of their leaders, the rebellion of God's people who did not listen to the prophets of the day or obey the word of God. Let me frame confession for you really quickly. Confession is the simple Routine practice of admitting our mistakes before a holy God. It's taking responsibility for our disobedience. It's looking in the mirror to fix the blame for our wrongdoing. And Daniel is admitting here that he and his people had done wrong. He continues in verses 7 and 8 with more confession. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. Again, verse 7 contains a a pro-con statement. Daniel issues a profession. Lord, you are righteous, and then a confession. We are covered with shame. You know that word shame, it has an interesting meaning right now in our cultural context, doesn't it? Shame can be defined this way, as a a painful feeling arising from becoming conscious of something we've done that's dishonorable, sinful, or improper. So shame is that icky feeling. It's that, that nervous energy you feel in your spirit that wells up within you when you know you've done wrong. And according to Daniel, it's a proper response to recognition of sin before a holy God. But it seems like our society wants to shame shame and that we shouldn't use that word. And I think that here's where culture's on track. I don't think we should shame people. Does that make sense? I don't think that we should... um, humiliate someone because of who they are or what they believe. Are we all in agreement on that? We shouldn't shame people. 
But I think if you feel conviction or shame from the Holy Spirit of God inside of you because of the way you've spoken or treated someone or lost your integrity, I think that's okay. In fact, I think it's good. It is telling you that you're out of bounds. Your inner world is informing your choices. Do you see where Daniel's at here? He's talking about that kind of shame, feeling shame for disobedience. And look at those last words of verse eight. It's the second time Daniel says, we have sinned against you. He's admitting that there's unfaithfulness among his people. The prayer continues with further detail about their rebellion. Look at verse nine. I know, isn't this cheerful? I've taken every ounce of energy that you got from the Razorback wind yesterday and sucked it right out of your soul. Verse nine, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. That forgiving, that's the profession. Even though we have rebelled against him, that's the confession. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. Again, Daniel is confessing the sin and rebellion of Israel. You might ask, well, what did they do to warrant such a strong punishment? Well, they abandoned his law. Uh, they worshiped idols. They practiced sexual immorality. They ignored and killed his prophets. They compromised and rebelled. And their leaders practiced evil, even though they were God's chosen people living in the promised land. Verses 10 and 11 give us a cause and effect relationship. Daniel said, we have not obeyed, therefore we have experienced the curses and sworn judgments of the Lord. God poured his wrath out upon them. He brought upon the Israelites what the scripture says right here are the sworn judgments written in the law of Moses. Now, what is that getting at? What are the sworn judgments? judgments in the law of Moses. Well, verses 12 to 14, talk about those. It says that you have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us this great disaster, ruin of Jerusalem, exile to Babylon. Under the whole heaven, nothing has been, ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem, just as it is written in the law of Moses. So this punishment was foretold to the nation. And given to them as a warning, just as it was written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord, of, of Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. And the Lord did not hesitate to bring this disaster upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. Yet we have not obeyed him. So Daniel is acknowledging here that the consequences that he has experienced in the Babylonian captivity and the exile and the destruction of Jerusalem were right and just and were foretold as a warning to them. They were promised in the word of God. They were written in the law of Moses. God clearly warned them this was going to happen. If you want an interesting extra study, go to Deuteronomy chapters 28, 29, and 30. So the book of Deuteronomy is the second reading of the law. So Deutero is the second reading. And it's given by Moses to the people just before they enter the promised land. So Moses, right before they went into the promised land, said, hey, just let me remind you, here's the law of God. And at the end of it, he says, I set before you today life and death. If you choose to obey these laws I've given to you today, the Lord will give you blessings. In chapter 28, it starts to list all the blessings. And he says, but if you choose to disobey these laws, then I will bring upon you what? curses. And guess what one of the curses was? Well, look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 49 and 50. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you do not understand, the Babylonians. A fierce looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. He goes on. They will lay siege to all your cities, including Jerusalem, throughout your land. The high and fortified walls will fall down and they will besiege uh, the cities throughout the land your, the Lord your God has given you. He goes on to say that then you will be scattered 
among the nations. You will actually go into exile. So if you disobey the law, these consequences will come upon you. So Daniel is saying, okay, Lord, you're good profession. We've sinned. And I want to acknowledge that the life we're living right now is by our own doing. This is called confession. He's not fixing the blame. He's not saying, Lord God, look at what these Babylonians are doing to us. Or Lord God, look at what this tribe did or that tribe did. He's looking in the mirror and saying, I know who's at fault here. Me. I did wrong. I am experiencing the consequences. Lord, I know why we are here. Now verse 15 is going to lighten this up a bit. Daniel's going to move from confession and repentance to asking God for forgiveness and restoration. He says, now, Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned and we have done wrong. So, Lord, keeping with all your righteous acts, would you turn away your anger and your wrath? Would you turn it away from Jerusalem, your city on the holy hill, Our sins and iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and the people an object of scorn. So for the fourth time, he says, Lord, we've sinned. And then he asks for the Lord to remove his anger and wrath from them. Lord, we deserve your judgment. Lord, we confess. Lord, would you now show us mercy? He's moving from confession to restoration. He's moving to asking for forgiveness and to say, can we reconcile our relationship? If you don't take one thing from today, I want you to take away this statement. That confession of sin leads to restoration with God. Confession of sin leads to restoration with God. When we admit our wrongdoing, when we come clean before the Lord, when we quit hiding, when we allow his light to shine in the darkness of our heart, then there's healing and restoration. Now, let me be clear. When you place your faith in Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection, you are forgiven 100% past, present, and future, period. Do you hear me? Your faith in Christ merits his forgiveness. And when you place your faith in Christ, you are justified. You are legally declared righteous in the courtroom of heaven. All of your sin is credited to the cross and his righteousness is credited to your account. This is your position in Christ. But you still need to practice confession. Why? Because your relationship, your friendship with God will go up and down based on your obedience. Not your forgiveness, not your place in heaven, not whether you're a Christian or not, but your friendship with God. So if you're in marriage, you understand what I'm talking about. I got the ring on and Amy is stuck with me. But there are times that I need to go to her and ask for forgiveness and confess sin. And when I don't do that, it's a little chilly around the Hannon house. If you're a parent, you understand this. You're not going to abandon your child because of their disobedience. But it sure feels good when they come to you and say, you were right, I made a mistake, and I want you to forgive me. Doesn't that feel right? And so the same thing that we do in our earthly relationships, we need to do in our heavenly relationship. We trust in the position that we have in Christ. Heath talked about that and sang about it in that last song. But then we practice this relational reconciliation and restoration. So confession of sin leads to restoration with God. Do y'all see it? The last few verses, Daniel transitions to petition. So he's declared who God is. He's confessed his sin. He's asked God to turn away his wrath. Now he asks him for something. Now our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. He's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests because of our, we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act for your sake, 
my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Daniel boldly asked God to listen to him. He asked the Lord to remember the nation, the promised land, and specifically Jerusalem. He is asking God to send him home to rebuild the temple. This was a big request. And I love that line. I do not ask because of my righteousness. I ask because of your what? Your mercy. We don't earn God's favor. He gives it to us out of his mercy. And then Daniel prays with boldness and confidence. This is pretty bold. God, you better listen to me. You need to hear me and act. How can he pray that boldly? Well, he's praying God's will. He knew it was God's will for the nation of Israel to return to the land. You can summarize Daniel going before the Lord in chapter nine this way. He took the right posture. He went to the Lord humbly with a repentant heart in sackcloth and ashes. And then he professed God's goodness. He repeatedly acknowledged the greatness of God. He opened with a declaration of praise. And then he took ownership of his wrongdoing. Four different times, he just simply said, I have done wrong. When you're confessing sin to God, keep it simple. I've done wrong. Don't try to explain it away. And it also works with human beings as well. And then lastly, after all that business was taken care of, he went before the Lord and asked a big request for his people. Well, here's how I wanna close our time together. We still have some good time left. But I wanna just talk about prayer and confession. I want us to practice it. So let's all close our notes and Bible. Don't grab your purse. Turn off your YouTube TV. Don't check your bracket. And let's go to the Lord. And I just want to guide us through a time of prayer and confession. So whatever that looks like for you, assume a posture of humble repentance. And we're going to confess our personal sin. We're going to confess the sins of our nation. We're going to pray for the world. And we're going to pray for some personal requests just between you and the Lord. And then we're going to close our time taking communion together. So let's commune with God. Would you pray with me? Hear this verse from Psalm 51. It says, Give ear our God. I'm going to go back and read Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So now take some time just between you and the Lord and the quiet of your heart and confess your personal sins to your holy God. Forgive us, for we have sinned. And now let's take some time and confess the sins of our nation. This is not a political statement. It has only to do with where our people have gone wayward from the Lord. So whatever comes to your mind, confess it on behalf of our people and ask God to forgive our country.
now let's take some time and enter into petition. Let's start by praying for something in the world. There's an earthquake yesterday in Ecuador. There's ongoing devastation in Turkey, a war in Ukraine. Pray for one of our global workers that you know that lives overseas proclaiming the gospel. Spend some time in the quiet of your heart praying for something globally. pray for something personal to you whether that be for something in your life or your family's life or maybe a friend or loved one maybe someone who's sick or struggling someone who's just having a tough time in life let's lift them up to the Lord Or Lord, I pray that you would hear these prayers and that you would act and that you would make a difference in the lives of those we've lifted up. Lord, as we come to your table to take communion, I pray that you would remind us of the cost of our forgiveness. Oh Lord, we need you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
upon his heart a broken world the wage of sin all the weight of our transgressions was upon him upon him Christ has died we are forgiven in Christ I don't know about you, but confession is not something that we look forward to. But doesn't it feel good to do it? Confession of sin leads to restoration with God. And let's never forget what it costs. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Take, eat. then he took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. This is what it cost to be forgiven, past, present, future. Never forget, take, drink. Would you stand with me and let's declare that truth. Praise the King. Praise the King. Oh, 
Fellowship family, I love you. Be safe as you go. If you need prayer, the Sloans are in the prayer room. Remember to pray for those that we have out on mission trips and at camps. God bless you guys. When my strength is gone and all I've known is striving. When your grace is just a word I've always sung. Will you pull me close and help me feel your wounds again? Lead me to rest. When it is finished, Christ is overcome. When it is finished, the work forever done. Rest again, hold my soul, be still and know. It is finished, it is finished When my hope is resting squarely on my shoulders And peace is slowly slipping through my of our souls and our hearts. 